Papa. Spakop. Ila hier te nemen mooi. Die had ik geen. A blessed Good Friday to all. Today we're going to do the seven last words of Jesus. And we're going to take up the first word of Jesus from the cross. He said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. My reflection on this. It makes sense that the first word of Jesus from the cross is a word of forgiveness. That's the point of the cross after all. Jesus is dying so that we might be forgiven for our sins, so that we might be reconciled to God for eternity. That word perhaps could have stirred disturbance among the people who witnessed his crucifixion. It is difficult to fathom how Jesus, who was in an excruciating pain at that moment, could have pleaded his Father to forgive those who have mocked him and nailed him to the cross. At the brink of his last breath, he was still thinking about saving those who have persecuted him. Of course, he was fulfilling his promise to love all men unconditionally. Admittedly, I myself find it difficult to imitate Jesus. Perhaps, if I have been offended by a certain person, Yet knowing his actions were done unintentionally or out of ignorance, I could probably forgive him outrightly. Otherwise, if the offender knew that his action was wrong, then it would likely be impossible for me to forgive him. One time, I had a conflict with my elder brother because of money matters. To my surprise, he falsely accused me of malversation of company funds. We were actually in the same business as partners. In one of our phone conversations, he was temperamental and shouted at me. I shouted back because I knew he was blinded with truth. But I regretted my actions after we hung up. Since he was my older brother, I stood by my rights and never acceded to his will. For long, we were not talking, even when the business continued to run. As I reflected, I was led to the cross. The cross reminded me of forgiveness. Jesus never uttered a word against his persecutors. Rather, he pleaded, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. In one of my prayer time and frequent visits to the Adoration Chapel, I asked God to grant me the grace to forgive and let go. I heard God telling me to venerate the crucifix and imitate his son Jesus. The next day, I texted, I texted my brother, by simply saying sorry. It was like me pleading and saying, Father, forgive him, for he does not know what he is doing. He immediately replied, saying sorry too. Since then, our trust and respect for each other grew more intimately until this day. I thank Jesus for his teaching about forgiveness. Without it, I would not have reconciled with my brother yet. This Good Friday, I would encourage you to go and forgive someone who has offended you or whom you have offended. Remember this. The miracle of forgiveness knows no impossibilities because it knows no bound. Allow me to share my reflection we need to be forgiven by God in order to be saved. Jesus' blood is the only way for this to happen. When we experience Christ's gracious forgiveness, we receive peace. 
So, to retain this peace, it is necessary to forgive others. Few years ago, an incident took place in my sister's home, which terribly hurt me. It used to be our ancestral home. Her husband, my brother-in-law, had gone berserk against my helpless and aging father who took shelter there. It started with an argument between my sister and him, which prompted my father to say something that hurt his feelings. It was a way of disciplining him for going against my father in many occasions. In other words, my father was not welcome in his own home. My younger sister reacted furiously and wanted vengeance. She persuaded my father to withdraw his plan of awarding the property to my elder sister's family as an inheritance. Deep inside me, I was mad, but I was also soft-hearted to my elder sister because we had a good relationship. My brother-in-law became an outcast for quite some time. He never showed up in many family gatherings. I believed he must have regretted everything he did. I asked intercession from friends and even from our community for healing in our family. Out of the blues, my elder sister told me that my brother-in-law wanted to reconcile. He asked for forgiveness. I asked God to forgive me the grace to accept his peace offering. And I forgave him. There was so much peace in my heart witnessing the reconciliation of my family slowly developing. When my father died early this year, a miracle of healing took place. We forgave each other to start a new beginning. My father gave up his life to bring healing into our family, just as Jesus had to shed blood to save us from our sins. Forgiveness is the ultimate way to receive peace. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of peace. Wishing you all a blessed Good Friday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and all the graces you have bestowed upon us. We know we don't deserve your grace, O Lord, and yet you gave it through your love. Help us to forgive, just as you did, when you sent your Son to die in the cross of Calvary for us. He suffered an unimaginable death, all for lowly sinners like us. Lord, we kneel before you, broken in heart for all the wrongdoings done against you, and we beg for your mercy. Heavenly Father, forgive us, for we do not know what we are doing. There are a lot of unknowns, Lord, in our lives. In fact, we do not know on what we do not know on what lies ahead. Please forgive our sins, especially that we have seen you in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions. Please forgive us, O Lord. Please forgive us. This we ask, ask in Jesus' name. name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Thank you for staying and watching my sharing on the second last word. Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Sana all. How I wish it will be that simple to enter into heaven with just a password or a hashtag. Lord, remember me when you are in paradise. Yet, 
scripture tells us that it is easier for a camel to enter into the eye of a needle than for a man with a fat bank account to enter into the kingdom of heaven. There seems to be a very wide and scandalous discrepancy on the system of awarding who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. As I reflected on this second last word, I made four points of realization. Number one, that Jesus responds with mercy to a repentant sinner. Number two, that humility brings forgiveness. Number three, nothing can be better than being close to the Lord. And number four, we should examine our conscience every end of the day and repent and if possible, go to confession. Growing up, we were taught catechism in the home and in school. We were asked to attend Sunday Masses, listen to homilies, and then as I entered school, I was schooled in Catholic schools. I believe that Demas, the thief who stole heaven, have the same growing experience as I have. I believe that he also went to the synagogue, attended Sabbath, and he knew what was right and what was wrong. Yet, he continued sinning just like me. The unrepentant sinner, Estas, also believed in God, but believes more of himself to make things happen and apparently dismisses the reality of hell. That it that is why it was so casual for him to challenge the Lord. Binugoy ka yung pag-ingon ng parts. If you are truly the Son of God, libriha ka direwe, pakanao ka ng tulo diris, kuros. Well, I must admit, I also have that kind of attitude in my life in the past. I also challenge God. I even challenge him that if truly you are a God, why did you allow children to die during the Ormoc flood? I thank the Lord that now that I am a touched sinner during this corona crisis virus, I do not question him anymore why this is happening to the world today. These two thieves, like Zacchaeus, must have also heard about Jesus and the miracles he did during his time, like the multiplication of the bread and feeding thousands. They must have heard about Jesus raising the dead to life. And Demas believed in it, and apparently Estas did not. That is why I believe that it was not a quick thinking on the part of Demas to be able to say those magic words that made him enter the kingdom of heaven. But rather, it was a genuine position of the heart on the part of Demas to believe in Jesus so that he was able to voice out what was in his heart with great humility, accepting that he deserved the punishment. So, bisag sumtok sa buwan tong iyang gipamulong, Lord, remember me when you are in paradise. 
the Lord honored his request. The words, remember me when you are in paradise, did not just pop out from nowhere, but it emanated from the purity of the heart of a sinner that was Demas. And this gives hope to a touched sinner like me, and hopefully to you also, that even if we continue to sin, we still have a chance to enter into the kingdom of heaven. To end this short sharing, let me repeat what I said at the start, the points that I was able to gather from this reflection. First, that Jesus always responds with mercy to a repentant sinner. Second, humility brings forgiveness. Third, we should continuously examine our consciences every day and ask forgiveness from the Lord for the wrongs that we have done. And if possible, go to confession frequently. And fourth, what can be better than being close to the Lord? Kani si Dimas, swerte ni siya nga gilansang siya kilid sa itong ginoo. Dagan man sila itong ipaglansang sa puros ba? Pero ang uban at itong layo-layo na. When you are close to the Lord, you can whisper your desires of your heart and He will honor it. That is why it is very important that we continue to seek to be near to the Lord, to continue to have fellowship with Him in our prayer time, in our relating with one another, and in our actions. That Truly I say, this day you shall be with me in paradise. The second of Jesus' last words on Good Friday. My first insight on this instant promise of Jesus to the thief who hung beside him on the cross in Calvary was, what a great travesty of justice from a God whom I look up to as someone who is just beyond any doubt. How can one who has been a robber, presumably most of his lifetime, how can he be able to steal paradise in a jiffy, just like that? Kawatan gid ni si Dimas. But ingon ani na ba ni? Getting to enjoy the world to the hilt, even sinfully on one hand, and on the other hand, successfully grabbing a place in heaven at an instant, at the eleventh hour at that, just by a request addressed to Jesus. But upon reflection, I came to realize and shamefully acknowledge my blunder in the light of my nothingness compared to God's greatness. Who am I to set parameters or impose boundaries on God's sense of justice? So unlike what is earthly, Jesus' kind of justice is one tempered with mercy to every heart that repents. And that was Demas, the repentant thief. The dying Jesus bestowed on him not just any kind of compassion and mercy, but divine mercy at its perfect best. I, on my part, can never abuse God's mercy, inexhaustible though it is. One who wallows in sin can certainly never be lucky enough all the time to steal heaven at the eleventh hour, like the good thief. I still believe that after all, Demas must have done something good sometime in his life. He must have believed and must have been awed by Jesus, even perhaps from a distance. 
So salvation is nothing else but grace. And this is my prayer. That my merciful God will grant me his divine enabling to live my life moment by moment in the shadow of his grace and that as i close my eyes in death i can hear the same words from jesus truly today you shall be with me in paradise good afternoon the holy spirit amen dear lord jesus how we wonder at your grace and mercy when we cry out to you, you hear us. When we ask you to remember us when you come into your kingdom, you offer the promise of paradise. Your mercy, dear Lord, exceeds anything we might imagine. It embraces us, it encourages us, it heals us, and most of all, it brings us salvation. O oh Lord, though our situation is different from the criminal who cried out to you, in many ways we are like him today we live trusting you and you alone our life both now and in the world to come is in your hands jesus remember us when you come into your kingdom remember me today as i seek to live within your kingdom amen, amen. in the name of the father and of the son and the holy spirit Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. In the end, Jesus was not absolutely alone. The apostles had gone to hiding because of their fear of the authorities. At his cross, there are four women who loved him. Some commentators explain their presence by saying that in those days, women were not so important that no one ever took any notice of women disciples. And thus, these women were running no risk at all of being near the cross of Jesus. It was always a dangerous thing to be an associate of a man whom the Roman government believed to be so dangerous that he deserved the cross. It is always a dangerous thing to demonstrate one's love for someone whom the Orthodox consider as a heretic. The presence of these women at the cross was not due to the fact that they were so unimportant that no one would notice them. Their presence was due to the fact that perfect love casts out fear they are a strange company of one Mary the wife of Cleopas we know nothing but we know something of the other three Mary Jesus's mother maybe she could not understand but she could love her presence there was the most natural thing in the world for a mother Jesus might be a criminal in the eyes of the law but he was her son the eternal love of motherhood is in Mary at the foot of the cross there was Jesus's mother's sister she's not named the Gospel of John but in Mark and Matthew it is made clear that she was Salome the mother of James and John the strange thing about her is that she had received from Jesus a very definite and stern rebuff. Once she had come to Jesus to ask him to give her sons the chief place in his kingdom. 
and Jesus had taught her some wrong how wrong her ambitious thoughts were Salome was the woman he had rebuked and yet she was there at the cross her presence says much for her and for Jesus it shows that she had the humility to accept rebuke and to love on with undiminished devotion it shows that he could rebuke in such a way that his love shone through the rebuke Salome's presence is a lesson to us on how to give and to receive a rebuke there was Mary from Magdala all we know about her is that out of her Jesus cast out seven demons she could never forget what Jesus had done for her his love had rescued her and her love was such that it could never die it was Mary her motto written in her heart I will not forget what he has done for me for the significance of the sin with Mary and the beloved disciple let's refer back to the wedding feast at Cana when Jesus addressed Mary as a woman a woman played an another important role another part of the Bible the Garden of Eden as man sinned now in another garden Golgotha another woman plays a significant role as man is redeemed from sin but in this passage there is something which surely is one of the loveliest things in the gospel story when Jesus so his mother he could not but think of the days ahead he could not commit her to the care of his brothers for they did not believe in him yet and after all john had a double qualification for the service jesus entrusted to him he was jesus's cousin being salome's son and he was the disciple whom Jesus loved so Jesus committed Mary to John's care and John to Mary's so that they should confront its other's loneliness when he was gone there is something infinitely moving the fact that Jesus in the agony of the cross when the salvation of the world hung in the balance he thought of the loneliness of his mother in the days ahead he never forgot the duties that lay to his hands he was Mary's eldest son and even in the moment of his cosmic battle he did not forget the simple things that lay near home to the end of the day even on the cross Jesus was thinking more of the sorrows of others than of his own Jesus tenderly provides for his mother at his death it is probable that Joseph her husband was long since dead and that her son Jesus had supported her now that he was dying what would become of her he saw her standing there and he knew her cares and griefs and he saw John standing not far off so he established a new relationship with his beloved mother and his beloved disciple he said to her woman behold your son for whom from now on you must have a motherly affection and to John behold your mother to whom you must pay a sonly duty and so from that hour never to be forgotten that disciple took her to his own home Notice the care that Jesus took of his dear mother. He was not so much taken up with a sense of his sufferings as to forget his friends, all whose concerns he bore. His mother, perhaps, was so taken up with his sufferings that she didn't think of what would become of her. But he did. He had no other way to provide for his mother than by his interest in a friend which he did here he calls her woman not mother 
not out of any disrespect to her, but because mother would have been so cutting word to her, who was already wounded with grief. He directs her to look upon John as her son. Behold him as thy son who stands there by you and be as a mother to him. This was an honor a put upon John and a testimony both to his prudence and to his fidelity. If he who knew all things had not known that John loved him, he would not have made him Mary's guardian. It was also a great responsibility for John, but he accepted it cheerfully and took her to his own home. Can we as children cheerfully accept the great responsibility of taking care of our aging parents in their times of need? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. As we reflect on the third word of the cross, we see you, Jesus, full of love, even if you're dying in agony, gasping for each other. Still, you put your love for your mother above your suffering. For many times, we have failed to take our responsibility to our family. Sometimes, we find it complex and difficult to balance. We ask, O oh Lord, that you may teach us to love you and our family despite our personal struggles. Help us to protect our family even when times get rough or when other duties call us. May we not be blinded by our pain, but continue to serve you through the love and sacrifice we gave to our family. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Every Good Friday, we Catholics find ourselves at the foot of the cross, contemplating on the passion of Christ. Once again, we hear the cry of the Lord echoing the opening verse of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Christ expresses the desolation he felt in his human nature. Here, Christ is suffering. Did Christ regret dying on the cross for us? Did he despair as he hung on the cross? How can we dive deeper into the cry of Christ in relation to what we are facing today? When we are blessed, we enjoy the sunny side of life and can easily turn to our Lord with hands up high, singing songs of praise and thanksgiving. But what happens when we face the ugly side of life, when we are overcome by sufferings, by death, financial burdens, misfortunes, family and relation problems, or being isolated alone with this ongoing pandemic? Lament is a prayer for help, coming out of pain, expressing our real dependence on God. As a BCBP member, you have a very good idea who God is. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, always in control of everything. But when we face uncertainty, our human side is quick to question. 
Where is the Lord? This cry to God should not be confused with despair. For in despair, we give up our relationship to God and let it go. Like the psalmist, our relationship with God should be foundational. In our loneliness are, do we feel that we are forsaken not only by man, but by God? If so, can we still call out to God in prayer, expecting that He will hear us? Even at times like this, when we cannot experience God's closeness due to the absence of holy sacraments, we must believe that God does care for us and is always within shouting distance. Lamenting is not a failure of faith but an act of faith. Going back to the cross, Jesus is truly broken. In terms of his entire distress, the decisive moment is when he cries out to God the Father, asking why he has been abandoned. To feel abandoned by God when no one has known him is certainly the worst imaginable spiritual torment. Many of us have experienced this to some degree as a result of sin or dryness in our devotions or an onslaught of doubt. Jesus too has been here. He is Emmanuel, God with us, with us even in those times of seemingly divine abandonment. On the cross, Jesus experienced the deepest level of interior sorrow imaginable. This means that there is no sorrow we can possibly suffer that is beyond Jesus' reach. And if we can't sense his touch, if the light of faith seems to falter, if we have passed our breaking point, if we can't bring ourselves to pray in our usual way, then just simply cry out to God. The cry of Christ is an invitation to embrace His suffering. It is an invitation to embrace your suffering. It is an invitation to embrace the suffering of others. As we contemplate daily on the cry of Christ, let us not only hear His voice, but also the voice of the poor, who are closest to Christ. They cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because of injustice, because of hunger, because of being unloved. May we respond as Christ's hands and feet, for a Savior's hands and feet are nailed on the cross for you and me. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Dear Jesus, who for my love hung in agony upon the cross, and who, forgetting your own sufferings, gifted me with your Holy Mother as a pledge of your love through her. I pray that I will be enabled to call upon you with confidence in my greatest need. Have pity on me and all the faithful who are in their last agony. Through the interior martyrdom of your dear mother, inspiring my heart, affirm trust in the infinite merits of your most precious blood, so that I may be able to escape the eternal damnation which I have merited my sins. My God, I believe in you, I hope in you, and I love you. I repent of having offended you by my sins. Amen.
fifth word is I thirst. And we would like to give our reflection or sharing coming to Haniloy on the fifth word of Jesus, which is I thirst. When Jesus said I thirst, um, Christ's thirst was actually not only physical. It felt like he was in agony, knowing that he was surrounded by blindness, cruelty, and hardness of heart. I felt that he meant, I thirst for you, I thirst for your love, and I thirst for your faithfulness. It is at this point that I realized that there are a lot of times when I turn away from him. I linger in my prayer time. I lose focus and prioritize other things, worldly things. And I myself feel that I am also thirsty for something, something the world cannot provide. So it is at this point that I come to reflect on how do I quench your thirst, O Lord? You're done. So like what Loy has said, it is not only physical thirst that, the, that Jesus wanted to express, but more so it was also a spiritual thirst. In my reflection, when I um, got this message or the word that I thirst, I felt that Jesus said, when he said na I thirst or biohauko was more than what his body needed, I felt that he was calling me to turn away from sin and to follow him. And that is a great reassurance or a promise that he is the living water that will satisfy my thirst. So, bono siya ang reflection akong nakuha um, pertaining to the side of Jesus. Individually, as in, uh, for me, a personal reflection, I also realize that um, there are a lot of people who thirst for love. There are a lot of people who thirst for the sense of belonging, for caring families, and for forgiveness and reconciliation. Like the deer that pant for the water, my soul longs after Jesus. And as we look at the crucified Christ, we share in his anguish and we cry out with him that I thirst. Join us in prayer, brothers and sisters, as we do this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, I thank you for thirsting for me in the midst of your own suffering and pain. Thank you for giving your life to me without reserve as you hung up on, upon the cross. Your love is the only thing that will ultimately satiate my thirsting soul. Give me the grace I need to come to you in my brokenness and sin so as to offer you all that I have for your thirst. I love you, dear Lord. Help me to love you more. Jesus, I trust in you. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen.
a blessed day everyone brothers and sisters we are now going to reflect on the six last words of jesus taken from john chapter 19 verse 30. when he had received the drink jesus said it is finished it is finished natapos na so what has been finished many reflections said that these words of jesus means his great work of redemption was finished it was finished but it begs somehow begs the question on what has been started the answer lies in eden when man was created by god and we were given a simplistic story of how man and woman had fallen for the tricks of the devil and were banished from paradise but what i found helpful was your reflection on what drove lucifer to tempt adam and eve and became satan and in turn ruled over the world we read in genesis chapter 1 verse 28 god said to them referring to aid adam and eve be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth this dominion or authority given to man had been the power lucifer was after he believed this is something he can use against god so how was the authority transferred then we read in Genesis chapter 3, the command of God to Adam and Eve that they can eat all the fruits of the trees in the garden, except from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or else they will die. The serpent said it was not true, but rather their eyes will be opened and they will be like God. This is now the word of God versus the lies of the serpent when man chose to obey satan this was when he handed over to him the dominion because we know that to whoever you will obey he has authority over you this was confirmed also in luke chapter 4 verse 6 during the temptation of jesus and said and satan said to jesus to you, I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. With this, Satan now has the power over the earth where he spread his lies, hate, fear, and all kinds of evil. Sin has now entered the world. Satan has now influence over the world. But God, in all his power, he is all that powerful. I mean, he could just change the world right then and there, there at his will. Why send Jesus? Yes, God is powerful and without flick of his hands, he can change. But he did not do it because God honors his words. Such dominion was already, already been given to man. Unfortunately, this was handed over to Satan by man himself. Therefore, only man can restore such authority. That's why Jesus has to become man, obey God even in suffering and death. In John chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus said, It is finished, because he has already fulfilled what God has commanded reversing what had happened in the garden obedience restoration does this mean that restoration is given automatically to all to all people mm, i think no dominion was restored to jesus through his obedience man then has access to this through jesus in John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. 
Therefore, to be connected to Jesus, this means that we must repent from our sins, believe that He has died for us, and accept Him as our Lord and Savior. As in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 9, He said, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. But as we reflect um, in, in these times during the pandemic, we can sense so much fear, uncertainty, of hate, and even disbelief. Why? Uh, not more of the why, maybe, but on how. How is your relationship with the Lord? Do you believe that God is able to protect you and your family? And even in death, He will be there to receive you and bring you to heaven. Do you really believe that God loves you? Nothing will secure your heart until God's love is in you. Do you still spend time to listen to Him and obey His words? Let this then be our reflections for the six last words. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we humbly come into Your Holy Presence to acknowledge You and give thanks for the greatest sacrifice of Your Son, Jesus Christ who died on the cross for us. Lord, we deeply understand that you have carried out your mission. Your death on the cross ends your physical suffering and it prompts us to do our duty to carry on with what you have started. To show compassion to one another, to spread love and respect, and most of all, to continue spreading the good news that we have been saved through your sacrifice. Lord, we will take this opportunity to realign our lives once again and put our full focus on you and make you the center and the Lord of our lives again. We thank you, O Lord, and we give you back all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Chapter 23, verse 46. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. The seventh word. At this point, Jesus commends and entrusts his spirit to the Father. Jesus knew that by his death, he would be saved, and in time he will rise up again and sit at the right hand of the Father. Jesus entrusts his future to the Father in order for, our, for the scriptures to be fulfilled and for our salvation. On a personal level, this verse hit me like a bullseye, right in the center of the pandemic. Allow me to share with you a recent and ongoing experience with COVID-19. As most of you know, Maya and I are both doctors by profession. And although I would not technically identify ourselves as frontliners, we are both very much involved in our respective hospitals' COVID task force. Mai is head of the Food Donation Committee and myself the overall chair in our 
in another hospital 18 kilometers from Cebu City. When the COVID-19 started in China, I had anticipated it would not take long before it reaches the Philippines and, of course, Cebu. What I did not expect was how worse it would be more than what we were always taught in med school. By the second week of March, Mai was then placed in home quarantine after traveling to Manila a few days earlier. And to make things worse, our hospital administrator and head nurse were also quarantined after attending their convention in Manila. It was like a perfect storm. This was the start of the community quarantine and I felt the whole hospital's survival was entrusted into my trembling hands. It was stressful physically, mentally, and definitely spiritually. It was and still is a battle where we could not see the enemy and with no ending in sight. When one of our own BCBP brother and sister died due to the COVID-19, what was once difficult and stressful had now also become scary. Bishop Cardinal Tagle could not be more precise when he said, fear is more dangerous than the virus. One by one, our doctors stopped holding clinics and you could feel the tension in every corner of the hospital. Down on my knees, I surrendered it all to the Lord. Isaiah 41 verse 10, and I quote, Do not fear, for I am with you. This verse kept me calm and sane since this all began. I realized being scared was good because it kept me vigilant, cautious, and prayerful. Prayers kept my fear in check and did not paralyze me. Each day during my prayer time, I entrust everything to the Lord. Father, into thy hands I commend it all, was my favorite line. To abide in his presence and to beg him to take control of everything. Each day a new lesson is learned in this lockdown. And in every opportunity, I am blessed to be an ambassador for Christ. In BCBP, I have learned that we have a faithful and merciful God who is the greatest physician and healer. We have an amazing Father who is our shield that is stronger than any face shields or N95s. We have Jesus who is our protector, mightier than all the PPEs and hazmats combined. And we have the Holy Spirit as our vaccine against the coronavirus. This pandemic is by no means near an ending, but we continue to entrust and commend everything to the Lord. For we know, whatever comes, our future is safe in His hands. Father, Father into, into thy, thy hands, hands we entrust our, our future. future. I would like to share to you two things. First is that there is a truth greater than all the sorrows and losses in life. And it can be revealed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In His final breath, Jesus entrusted his spirit to his father. For a moment, Satan laughed. He thought he won. The Messiah is dead. Darkness has covered the earth. However, Satan's victory was short-lived. Suddenly, all hell broke loose because Jesus descended into the dead and broke the darkness with his glorious light. What seemed like a defeat was victory in the making. For a life marked with failure, Jesus' death is forgiveness. For a heart filled with hopelessness, his death means purpose. And for a soul looking into the tunnel of death, his death is deliverance. The truth is, there is forgiveness in Jesus' life, purpose and deliverance in Jesus' death, and hope in Jesus' resurrection. My second reflection is the lesson on surrender. God is at his best when our life is at its worst. He appears at the strangest of places and worst timing. 
I need only to surrender myself into his hands for him to work amazingly in my life. This is one of the greatest lessons the pandemic has taught me. Last March 15, while on home quarantine as a person under monitoring, I started a COVID kitchen, a food donation drive for the frontliners in the hospital I am affiliated to. We started with just 20 members of the COVID team, but as the cases increased, the team members also increased. On April 1st, we were already feeding three meals a day for 100 frontliners, composed of doctors down to the utility and security guards. There were several occasions that the funds and food sponsors were depleting, but this situation has taught me how to rely fully on God's providence and the people's generosity. I would receive calls and text messages from brothers and sisters in this community, from people I know and I don't know, informing me of their intention to donate. A brother in the BCBP who works in an industry donated their corporate outreach funds for the COVID kitchen, plus bonus donation for PPE in Sanders Affiliated Hospital. A Veshi sister who caters for the COVID team took the initiative to raise funds herself and was able to come up with an amount enough for eight feedings of 100 persons. Her husband also helped Sander procure the PPEs needed in his affiliated hospital. Then there are the walk-in donors, bringing provisions more than enough for the team. God is at his best when our life is at its worst. He appears at the strangest of places and the worst of timings. If not for this pandemic, I would never have experienced the feeling of helplessness and in need. The need to feed these people in the upcoming days. The humility of being at the receiving end. The Lord taught me how to surrender, to let Him take control, to let Him be the sovereign God that He is. Into your, your hands, hands, Lord, I, I commend my spirit. Let us continue to uh, honor the Holy Trinity as we say, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, as we uh, continue to reflect upon your seven last words, Lord, may we remember, Lord, the suffering that you went through before going through this, Lord. May we remember how you were unjustly scourged at the pillar, Lord, how you were crowned with thorns, Lord, in insult to your glory, Lord, how you were made to carry the heavy cross of our sins, Lord, how you were nailed to the cross, and how you were insulted by the people who were watching you suffering, Lord. Lord, as we, um, despite all of these um, insults and suffering, Lord, you displayed mercy to the people insulting you and mercy to the thief beside you, Lord. And above all things, Lord, you were able to show faithfulness, Lord, to the Father, Lord, to follow His will, Lord. Lord, as we continue to reflect upon your seven last words, Lord, may we remember that during the times when we are insulted, when we are humiliated, when we are suffering, Lord, may we remember the example that you have shown us, Lord, that we may show forgiveness and mercy to the people insulting us, and that we may continue to show faithfulness to the Lord whenever we experience suffering, Lord. All this we ask through the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen.